The following program contains scenes and language of a frank and explicit nature. Viewer discretion is advised. There are questions everywhere as this strange story winds around and around and ends up in a cemetery where Kitty and her husband, Jose Menendez, lie buried with a secret. Eric and Lyle were formally indicted in December 1990. The boys cracked smiles as they were formally charged with first-degree murder. They pleaded not guilty. Hmm. Turns out they had been amused when the judge said, Jose, instead of Jose. Thus started their unshakable public image of being spoiled rich kids with no remorse. The trial began on July 20th, 1993 at Van Nuys Superior Courthouse, about 10 minutes from here. Yeah, yep. very close to us. And was presided over by Judge Stanley Weisberg. Pamela Bazanich was assigned as lead prosecutor. She argued that the murders were premeditated and committed for financial gain. Abramson argued in perfect self-defense due to years of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse by Jose and Kitty. Get out of here. Mm. Is imperfect self-defense, is that a legal like uh, characterization? Yes. Oh, wow. It's like, you know, what they could have done to me long term. Yes. Yeah, or what they thought was going to happen. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't like, oh, he's got a gun to my head and I hit his arm to get him out of yeah. the way. A lot of domestic abuse uh, does boil down to that. Yeah. Cameras were allowed in the courtroom and the proceedings were broadcast on court TV. And Can you this imagine is, that? This is the era of trash talk shows and the rise of unscripted reality. Uh, yep. we, we just talked about that on the Ray Combs episode, actually. Yep. This is the, the rise of Geraldo, or Geraldo they call him, uh, yeah, Phil Donahue. You call him. Uh, I call him only, <laughs> just because Anthony Kiedis did in that movie, The Chase. Yeah. Long story, mm. that's for the real dieheads out there. <laughs> but but yeah, it's, it's, it's when people started really invent, like Lorena Bobbitt, like, you know, yeah. when reality mm. was just like, king like people like stories kind of went by the wayside in the disgustingness of our human american population became entertainment yeah and other trials at this time lorena bobbitt as you just mentioned yeah pamela smart mm -hmm. and amy fisher and uh yeah, yeah. joey buttafuoco and amy fisher mm -hmm. yeah and they were all celebrity they became celebrities, all these nincompoop and criminals. They, and they all had TV movies yeah. about everything. And, yeah. And SNL did great uh, work on, um, you know, parodying them. Yeah. yeah. From a letter written by Lyle to Eric, 1990. Kyle, you want to read that? We alone know the truth. We alone know the secrets of our family's past. I do not look forward to broadcasting them around the country. All right. So the abuse is the big thing that came out during the trial. Sworn testimonies from the defensive side would go on to expose Jose Menendez as a monster who was mentally abusive and physically rough with his sons. That he was obsessively trying to mold Lyle into another version of himself. And he viewed Eric as his throwaway son, wow. often calling him cruel names like coward and the F word for gay people. Oh man. <laughs> He forbade tears and taught them to stop crying on demand. One morning, Jose's brother-in-law, Peter Cano, saw him punch a five-year-old Lyle in the chest after he misbehaved. Damn. Peter was outraged. Then Jose snapped, This is my house, and I'll raise my children any way I see fit. <laughs> like, wow. I'd be like, all right, I'll, I'll see you around. All right, pal. According to Peter's <laughs> I'm wife, I'm glad I came over. <laughs> according to Peter's wife and Jose's sister, Marta Cano, he wasn't the only problem. She had the impression that Kitty didn't have much affection for the boys, that she resented them for cooling down her marriage and stalling her career aspirations. A picture was painted of parents who considered their sons to be major disappointments. Nothing was ever good enough. Eric and Lyle needed to become star athletes or else. When they would lose a match, Jose would berate them, and then he'd be silent when they won. He would also humiliate Kitty in public, and according to the kids, beat her with a belt behind the scenes. Ish. Yeah. 
The most powerful testimonies during the trial came from Eric and Lyle themselves. They revealed that not only was their dad mentally and physically abusive to them, but that he was also a sadistic sex abuser as well. Jose started with Lyle when he was six years old and told him what they were doing was a male bonding ritual like the Romans. And let's hear a little of Lyle's oh, testimony. Well, yeah, the Romans were doing that, but it wasn't good. Yeah, you shouldn't copy them. He, said he talked about soldiers and having sex between them as a bonding mechanism. Yes. And did he talk about it with regard to fathers and sons? Uh, he talked about it with regard to our relationship as being very special and our family history uh, with first the firstborn and the father. And between the ages of six and eight, did your father have sexual contact with you? Yes. And how did it start? It just started with, after sports practices, he would massage me. And uh, we would have these talks, and he would show me. Some of the acts involved a toothbrush and a shaving utensil. Lyle then confessed that he would take Eric out to the woods sometimes and do the same thing to him. This went on for a couple of years and ended when Lyle was eight years old. Man. Jose began molesting Eric around the same age, but in his case, it never stopped. And it got more and more sadistic and brutal as time went on. He would force Eric to have oral and anal sex at knife point and then beat him mercilessly if he cried or showed weakness. Jose would use thumbtacks, needles, rope, and other sharp objects on his thighs and genitals. So torture. Yeah. This is horrific. Yeah. Whenever Jose went into the room with Eric, it was understood that they were not to be disturbed. This went on until shortly before the murders. Eric had recently graduated from high school and was anxious to go to UCLA. Lyle was home for the summer, but planning to return to Princeton in the fall. By the way, Jose would also make Eric eat lemons so that, uh, I can't even say this really out loud, so that certain things would taste better. Oh Oh my God. God. Jesus Christ. And now I'm going to go over the brother's account of how it went down. August 9th, 1989. The family was supposed to go to Canada to visit Kitty's dying father after Eric played in a tournament in Kalamazoo, Michigan. But he ended up losing, so Jose was pissed off, and they went back home instead. On August 15th, 1989, Lyle and Kitty got into it. Oh, this is Kyle's birthday. Yeah, this is what's going on on my third birthday. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Kyle just always stops the podcast. Yeah, says, let's hold Wait it a, up second. a second. This is three weeks away from my birthday. <laughs> hey, all I said was whoop whoop. <laughs> <laughs> Lyle and Kitty got into a heated argument about how she thought their tennis was ruining their lives. She began flailing her fists at him and screaming. As he raised his arm to defend himself, she ripped off the hair from the top of his head. Eric witnessed the whole thing from the entrance. He had no idea that his brother Lyle wore a toupee. Oh, what? I remember this. My mom told me about this. Mm-hmm. His really? hair was fake. Everything you've seen in photos, that's a toupee. Shut the fuck up. He lost up. his hair early. Yeah. Then. And Jose thought, since he's going to be the second Jose as he grew up, that he needed to get a toupee to look more like formidable. Right off the bat. Wait, so the one that looks like Blagojevich has the fake hair? Yes. That's fake? Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. It looks fake. Yeah, it looks like shit. I, I thought that looks real, and the other one looks it, fake. It looks like a Chia pet. <laughs> no, the I think uh, Eric just had really good hair. And yeah. Then, uh, you know. Well, that's why I think it looks fake, because it's like, oh, that's like the prim and proper one. This other one's just a fucking Chia pet. Yeah, it's, bl- just... it's the Blagojevich. <laughs> <laughs> I like how John's story to say it. Blagojevich. <laughs> Lyle stormed out and went to the guest house to reattach his hair. Oh, man. When he got out of the bathroom... I'm going to split your wig. (laughs) Eric was sitting on the bed crying. He said he was anxious to begin life as a freshman at UCLA, but that Jose recently informed him that he would not be staying in the dorms. Eric was being forced to live at home and would have to commute to the campus. Wow. So that Kitty could supervise his homework. 
Yeah. Not a bad. That's crazy. Then in college. Eric confessed that Jose had been sexually abusing him since the age of eight. Jesus. Lyle had been suspicious and confronted his dad when he was 13, but Jose told him it was over and that Eric was making things up. Lyle wanted to believe him, but he was now finding out that had been a blatant lie. Filled with rage at the situation, Lyle devised a plan where he would confront his father again, this time as an adult, and demand that Eric join him at Princeton that fall. Wow. Jose was currently out of town on business. He returned late on the night of August 17th, two days after Kyle's birthday. (laughs) Lyle told him he knew everything that was going on with Eric and that it had to stop. Jose then shouted, What I do with my son is none of your business. Well, I feel like it is. Lyle (laughs) called him a sick man and warned him that he'd tell everybody about the abuse if it came to that. Jose responded, We all make choices in life, son. Eric made his, you've made yours. Wow. Lyle interpreted that as a threat. He believed that his father would do whatever was necessary in order to protect his good name, including getting rid of his sons. Jose then stormed into Eric's room and threw him on the bed, screaming at him for spilling the secret. Eric scrambled out of the room and ran into Kitty downstairs. This is from the reporter Robert Rand's book, The Menendez Murders. But this is also based on their own testimony, right? Yeah. Yeah. Quote, what's the matter with you? Kitty said. You wouldn't understand, Eric told her. It's a guy thing. There was a smirk on her face. She seemed heavily medicated, and her voice had an off quality. I understand a lot more than you think. I've always known. What do you think, I'm stupid? Friday, August 18th, 1989. Eric and Lyle drove to San Diego and bought two Mossberg 12-gauge shotguns from Big Five Sporting Goods. Big Five! Uh Uh-huh. That's like, I didn't even know they had shotguns there. Yep. It's like where you go to get a baseball mitt at the last second. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) And they had birdshot ammunition that came with it. They used the stolen driver's license of Lyle's friend from Princeton, Donovan Goudreau, and they filled out the 4473 form with his info. And and that's in order, it's like the cooling off period to get a gun or something? Just the what you have to fill out to get the gun. Okay. The brothers practiced loading the shotguns on the ride back and hid them in Eric's bedroom closet when they got home. Saturday, August 19th, 1989, Jose and Kitty pretended like nothing happened and kept plans for a fishing trip on a boat called the Motion Picture Marine off the coast of the Marina del Rey. Is that his boat? No, they were renting it. Oh, someone else's, yeah. yeah. Jose yeah, would have been like the Eurythmic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Dave Stewart, uh, USS Dave Stewart. Yeah. The Menudo. <laughs> the Menudo. <Yeah. laughs> Jose told a business associate he was an experienced deep sea fisherman, so he wanted to learn the basics. Eric and Lyle tried to stall in order to avoid having to go on the trip where they basically thought they were going to get whacked. Oh. They went to another gun store and bought some buckshot ammunition. The clerk had told them that was better. That was stronger. Be- better ammunition. Yeah. yeah. For the guns. Okay. They showed up at the house at 4 p.m., hoping their parents were already at sea. But unbeknownst to them, shark fishing was preferable at sundown, so Jose and Kitty hadn't left yet. The whole family then went out on their adventure, Their fishing guide recalled there being a very negative energy in the air. When they got back that night, Jose and Kitty went to bed immediately. Eric and Lyle were restless, so they snuck out and drove around aimlessly, trying to decide their next course of action. Hmm. When they returned to the house, all the doors were locked. Kitty let them back inside, annoyed that they had woken her up. They reminded her they weren't allowed to have house keys. She then barked, if you had kept your mouth shut, things might have worked out in this family. Jose later pounded on Eric's door and then yelled that he'd have to come out in the morning and that he'll be there when he does. Eric cradled his new shotgun to sleep. On Sunday, August 20th, the brothers decided they should stay separated all day because if their parents were plotting to kill them, it would most likely happen if they were together. 
Eric went to the Church of the Good Shepherd on Santa Monica Boulevard. Uru. And then Lyle made those tentative plans with his tennis coach, Perry Berman, about meeting up at the food festival. Lyle walked into the house around mid-afternoon to see Jose and Kitty watching a tennis match on TV. They were quiet. Lyle mentioned something about a tennis camp he wanted to attend, but Jose told him it didn't matter anymore. When Perry called Lyle back, Jose lied and told him he was out shopping. Lyle overheard the exchange and became convinced that his parents were plotting to murder him and his brother. It's weird to even be living in a family where this could be possible. <laughs> like, you're like, maybe they will kill me. Maybe, you know, the vibe yeah. is kind of bizarre here. Maybe Beyond I'm, I'm doomed. Demented. Yeah. When Eric got back home around 9.30 p.m., Lyle filled him in on what had happened. Panicked, they made a beeline to the front door, only to be blocked by Kitty. Then Jose intervened. He demanded that Eric go upstairs and wait for him. Eric knew that this was code for his dad wanting to have sex. Jose then pulled Kitty into the TV room and closed the doors behind them. The brothers believed that was a signal they were about to be killed and that the time had come to take defensive action. They went outside by Eric's Ford Escort and mm. loaded their guns with the buckshot ammunition. Then they ran inside, burst through the living room doors, and fired away. Jose jumped up, crying, No, no, no! He was hit in the leg and then flew back on the sofa. The room was filled with deafening noise and clouds of gunpowder and smoke. When Lyle's gun emptied, they went outside to regroup. Eric handed Lyle a single birdshot shell, and he went back inside. Lyle walked in as Kitty was moaning on the floor, trying to escape. He put the barrel of the shotgun up to her cheek and fired. Man, that's that, cold blood. I know she knew about the, the all the sexual stuff, but still. That was it. Yeah. According to the autopsy report, one of the gunshots caused explosive decapitation with evisceration of the brain and deformity of the face of Jose Menendez. That's the worst type of decapitation. Explosive. <laughs> what a way to go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's the diarrhea and decapitation. It's <laughs> yeah. the worst. Explosive. You yeah. don't want to explosive for either of those. Yeah. Kitty was lying on her right side near her husband's feet. Every bone in her face was broken, and the rest of her body was ripped apart and shattered. My lord. Detectives well, yeah. thought the shots to the kneecaps were made to look like a mafia execution. Mr. Lintungliano says hello. <laughs> As the smoke cleared... Yeah, why would you shoot someone's kneecaps after you blow their head off? <laughs> yeah. yeah, Johnny kneecaps. As the smoke cleared, the brothers waited for the police to show up, but nobody came. The brothers then made the decision to cover up the murder in order to protect the Menendez family secrets. Or just them. So they sprung into action. They picked up the shells, grabbed the shotguns, and headed out. They thought the movie theater would make for a good alibi. At 10.30 p.m., Eric and Lyle arrived at the AMC Multiplex in Century City. They wanted to buy tickets for a movie they already saw, and one that started before the killings. Hmm. There was a showing of License to Kill that began around 8 p.m. Perfect. But that had sold out. Oh, maybe the not only, perfect. <laughs> the only other movie they'd seen was Batman, which was almost over. The girl behind the counter informed them that no tickets could be issued for a movie 20 minutes or more after its start time. Come on, man. We need an alibi. <laughs> yeah. So Maybe I'll do the bat dance. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, no, that's gay. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello. This is Lyle. <laughs> <laughs> so Eric and Lyle bought tickets for the next show, hoping there'd be no time stamp on them. But there was. Uh -oh. So they tossed the tickets in the trash and left. Shit! They then drove to a gas station in order to change clothes. They threw the old clothes and shotgun shells in a dumpster. Lyle tried to get his friend Perry to join them when they returned to the house. I guess he wanted moral support. Or, or someone else just there just to be like, oh my God, when I came with them, they mm -hmm. were shocked as I am. Nice thing to do or to a was. friend. Yeah. <laughs> but when that plan fell through, they drove around a little longer in a manic state and then finally went back home. Eric entered the TV room screaming, and Lyle called 911. We heard that call already. Hmm. 
The shotguns remained in the trunk of the Ford Escort. Oh, come on. Which was now parked in the garage as the police searched the rest of the house. They never went into the garage. Wow. Oh, look at a crack squad we got here. Yeah, Beverly Hills PD. <laughs> Days later, the guns were buried somewhere on Mulholland Drive. They were never recovered. Never. Never. Well, granted, Beverly Hills only has two murders a year, so they're like not yeah. prepared for this at <laughs> all. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a clip of Eric's testimony. All right. I just saw him go back into the den. And you saw the doors close? Yes. Now, at that point, Mr. Menendez, what did you think was happening? I thought my dad was going to come up to my room and have sex, and I thought they were going to kill us. Jesus. Now, when you went into the room, how soon did you start firing? Immediately. You said you were firing directly in front of you. Yes. If you're moving from the doors to the area with the TV and the coffee table, are you firing at the bookcases, which are directly in front of you? No. Or am I not understanding what you're saying? I was just firing as I went into the room. I just started firing. In what direction? In front of me. What was in front of you? My parents. My parents. So you were firing at your parents? Yeah. And I hope they burn in hell. I hope they burn in <laughs> hell. <laughs> Wait, was that the, the moment it, the whole case cracked up wide open? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, they admitted I, they did it. But it's yeah. pretty obvious. Who were you firing at? Uh, my parents. <laughs> well, if you listen to the entire testimony, it's over three hours. Okay. She is so tedious with the questioning. Now, where were you standing in the room? What, the TV was to your left, and then your brother was to your right? Now, you were nearer to the coffee table at that point, right? And he just goes, I don't know. I'm just <laughs> shooting. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, why, yo, why didn't you <laughs> take my yes that I did it? <laughs> right. Can, can, where, put the handcuffs on. Show <laughs> yeah. me to myself. Yeah. <laughs> so this account of the days leading up to the murders establishes that Eric and Lyle were in fear for their lives. A necessary narrative in order to claim self-defense. Yeah. But unfortunately for them, the overall consensus was that the brothers most likely did not think they were about to be murdered. People just don't believe that part of their story. However, their harrowing accounts of the horrific child abuse at the hands of Jose was another story. They left most people in the courtroom, including members of the press pool, in stunned silence and tears. Journalist Terry Moran called it simply unforgettable. Even naysayers, like journalist Dominic Dunn, who wrote about the case for Vanity Fair, found the brothers' allegations credible. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to blow my final thought here too early, but I think it's pretty credible. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Terry Moran said that their bad acting during the part where they were describing the, how their lives were in danger yeah. made their other testimonies about the abuse even more real because there was no acting there. Right. Um, I want to also just put in here that uh, we know Hollywood is bullshit and casting directors should be ashamed of themselves because how there was no Lifetime or made-for-TV movie where Dana Gould played one of the brothers. I saw Kyle setting up this whole thing for, uh, minutes ago. Exactly <laughs> like that fucking guy. Look at this shit. <laughs> it's weird. It's so weird. I see Dana Gould everywhere these days. I saw him on the picket lines the other day. Yeah. Oh. And I see him hiking at Fryman Canyon. I saw him at a Christmas party over the holidays. Well, so, will you quit stalking him? <laughs> I know. <laughs> it seems like, yeah, it's like uh, I, I'm the number one suspect if anything happens to Dana Gould. Well, be sure and tell him that he should play Lyle Menendez in a movie. He's from Hopedale, yeah. Massachusetts. I scared the shit out of him at uh, the Lyric Hyperion Theater. Really? I was trying to go into the bathroom as he was over. Opening the door, and I was just in the door, and he was just like, "Ah!" <laughs> you just said, you just whispered, "Menendez." Menendez. <laughs> um, I think uh, Lyle looks like Jose Canseco a little bit. Hmm. Yeah, a little bit. Okay. A little bit. Okay, maybe. Well, like that's a, the one I'm saying looks like Dana. Yeah, no, yeah, I know, yeah, but the, yeah, yeah the, he could look by like two people. <laughs> <at once. laughs> You're ruining his theory. Yeah, the I know. One. Sorry, sorry. We'll stick with Dana Gould. Yes, 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 yes. The other one just looks like a live action Beavis. <laughs> oh my God. He, was he was considered the good looking one, yeah. Eric. Yeah, he's got the natural hair. He's got real hair. Does look like he's got the cheekbones, huh? 
Yeah. Other evidence. I can and- see why the dead would not feel that. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> I was waiting for one of you to say that. Christ. <laughs> I'm just going to talk over that. <laughs> Other evidence and witness Please testimonies. Do. The defense presented disturbing naked photos of Eric and Lyle Man. taken when they were six and eight years old. The pictures were found in an envelope labeled Eric's sixth birthday, written in Kitty's handwriting. In 1977, Eric was admitted to the ER. A record detailed an unexplained injury to the back of his throat, which was consistent with oral copulation. My oh, my God. God. Six weeks fuck? before the murders, Kitty told her psychiatrist that she was hiding sick and embarrassing secrets about her family. Holy and shit. And that she thought her sons were sociopaths. Her sons? Her sons! She told sister-in-law Marta Cano that she wished her son had never been born. Cousin Diane Vandermolen testified that Lyle told her about the abuse when he was eight years old. Diane informed her Aunt Kitty, but was told that Lyle made it up and that she should mind her own business. On another occasion, she saw Kitty going into the bathroom to help Lyle shower. He claims they would often take baths together and she would make him pleasure her. Lyle said he slept in her bed until the age of 13 and that she turned on him when he stopped. That is twisted. Yeah. Cousin Andy Cano, this is uh, Marta's son, Cousin Andy, testified that when Eric was 12 and Andy was 10, Eric had told him that his dad is, quote, massaging his dick and was trying to find out if these massages were normal. (laughs) Eric made him pinky swear to never tell anybody. Wow. Two other cousins, Brian and Kathleen, who spent summers at the house, said Jose would take the boys to their bedroom to play some kind of game and forbade the cousins from going down the hall to join them. Cousin Alan Anderson testified that Eric went from an outgoing kid with happy eyes to an introverted sad kid. Jesus. Months before the trial, Donovan Goudreau, they use his fake ID to buy the gun or his real ID. Yeah. When he was still close friends with Lyle, he gave a recorded interview to that reporter, Robert Rand, claiming that Lyle revealed his sexual abuse to him at a Chinese restaurant in May, 1989. It followed Goudreau's own revelation of childhood abuse. Neighbor Alicia Herx said she attended a dinner party where Jose screened a violent sex film called Pijote. I thought it was going to be Salo. That featured yeah, child, second. child nudity. On 2020, she told a story about the time Jose thought the family dog killed their pet ferret. He put the dog to sleep in retaliation. Eric opened the refrigerator to find the dog's head. Oh, what? my God. Madam Sherry Woods this said... Is, that's true? That's what the neighbor says. Wow. Madam Sherry <laughs> hey, Woods... Uh, uh, do you want some lemonade? Yeah, just, it's right in the... Uh, right, right behind the, the, the dog's head. <laughs> right behind the Cocker Spaniel's head. <laughs> Madam Sherry said that she sent... No, further back. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's Madam hard. Sherry said that she sent Jose many escorts and that he would usually request underage girls. Oh, my God. Terry Baralt... So she admitted to being a child sex trafficker? I guess. (laughs) Terry, but this is the the level of sleaze. Alejandro is burnt out by this. I I just want to get over this (laughs) god awful, (laughs) disgusting laundry list. My God. Terry Baralt, Jose's sister, supported her nephews, but didn't believe the sex abuse claims. Brian Anderson, Kitty's brother, called the kids spoiled brats and didn't believe anything they said. Yeah, well, maybe your family's fucked up, dude. So that's the sordid tale of the Menendez family. (sighs) The trial became a media circus and it captivated the nation. The Menendez brothers were household names, and Leslie Abramson was a breakout star with her frizzy blonde hair and courtroom theatrics. One day, she walked through the hallway corridor of the courthouse, flipping her middle finger to the cameras the entire time. Wow. She's like the Eminem of like defense attorneys in the 80s. She's kind of like the dragon lady from the Twilight Zone case. Yeah. yeah. D'Agostino. D'Agostino. In her closing argument, Abramson put tax on those naked photos of the boys 
at all the spots where Jose used to put them. Mm. Eric and Lyle, to change the subject a little bit, yeah. were roasted, up here. <laughs> roasted for what some people perceived as overacting and their preppy fashion style. Pastel colors and crew necks with polo shirts underneath. Yeah. They became part of the zeitgeist of the 1990s. I'm sure you both remember this. Oh, yeah. There was endless coverage on cable TV, mainly on court TV and then CNN everywhere after that. And in newspapers and magazines. They were parodied in everything from Mad Magazine. You got that open, Kyle? Oh, t- he- he. It says All American Family. Yeah. yeah. So you got Uncle OJ, Uncle Woody. Is Soon Yi up there? No. No, yeah. Tanya Harding's here. Nice. <laughs> That's cousin Tanya. Yeah. Michael Jackson. We got uh, this woman ha- has Nazi stuff on her. I thought it was uh, the woman who. Marge Shot. Oh, I thought it was the one we oh, killed Selena. Okay. Was she a Nazi, Marcia? <laughs> she she doubted the Holocaust. Oh, uh, okay. And then you got Liana Hemsley and Dr. Jack Kevorkian. And at the bottom, you got brothers Eric and Lyle. Man. With Alfred E. Newman. Alfred E. Newman is labeled as the black sheep. What? <laughs> Me kill my family? <laughs> <laughs> and I had this copy of Mad growing up. Wow. So I very much knew about the case, but not really. Yeah. I just knew that they were public figures. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, like I said, that's no. And then we're looking at a picture from the SNL sketch. Which, John Malkovich? Yeah. Malkovich. Wow. The big joke in that sketch is that they're blaming it on two other brothers that nobody <laughs> knew existed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and some people nowadays are having a tantrum saying, how dare they make a joke of the case? Oh, God. That's what we're doing. Yeah. (laughs) And then (laughs) it was brilliantly parodied in The Cable Guy. Yes. And we have a clip of that right here. This is my favorite thing ever. So good. I like how they even use MTV MTV News. Today in the Sam Sweet case, the prosecution played the 911 call that Sam Sweet made the night he murdered his brother. Keep in mind, Mr. Sweet confessed one month later. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. My good brother's been shot. I think it was an Asian gang or something. I saw someone. He looked Asian. And he was speaking another language. I'm pretty sure it was Asian. Asian. <laughs> Tonight on UPN, oh, oh my the trial God. that's captured the nation. Everybody is waiting for the verdict. <laughs> the gladiator, yeah. my favorite. <laughs> Black. Love it. Cry, baby. I love you. Oh, oh yeah. Such ah, such Sam, Sammy, baby. Sammy, don't. Look who's Sammy. crying now. Eric Roberts is Sam and Stan Sweet in Brother, Sweet Brother, The Killing of Stanton Sweet. Parental discretion advised. <laughs> it's almost too good of a parody. On UPN. It's on UPN. <laughs> yeah. That's the best. I forgot. I never even noticed that small, minute detail. Uh, it's too good. Their story also inspired plot elements of natural born killers. And there was not one, but two TV movie events. Yeah. And we have a little TV spot from that one. This was the one with Edward James Olmos as Jose. Carnival games become deadly. Will sleight of hand reveal a killer? There's an old association between carnivals and black magic. Murder on the Midway. All new murder she wrote. That murder on the Midway. Was it fear that made them kill, or was it simply greed? I like we got the murder she wrote lead into the to the clip. <laughs> if you're dumber than the cops. Menendez after murder she wrote Sunday. <laughs> Menendez. They're all over the place. Menendez became synonymous with true crime before true crime was a thing. Yeah. yeah. So the trials end. 20 weeks and more than 100 witnesses later, the trial came to an end on December 3rd, 1993. There were four possible convictions. First degree murder, second degree murder, voluntary manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter. After weeks of deliberations, both juries could not come to an agreement. So in January 1994, Judge Weisberg announced that the jury was hopelessly deadlocked and declared a mistrial. It was considered a semi-win for the defense. Oh hell yeah! That's a that's yeah. huge. Well, the, from from people that said they did it. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. If you can get two or three mistrials, they'll be they'll say like we can't try yeah. this anymore. They'll mm-hmm. get tired of like scheduling more sl- dates. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah they, I killed yeah, my then, parents. <laughs> you drive off in that <laughs> that uh, what was the the Jeep Cherokee or <laughs> Jeep Wrangler? Jeep Wrangler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> drive to a sixty plus community yeah. in Marina Del Rey. There's a sign on the back <laughs> that says "Just Married" or "Just Got Out of Fucking." 
Kill it as your parents. And Lyle takes off his wig and goes, Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming up. <laughs> no, the, no, they're playing the Eurythmics. Uh, <laughs> dream, sweet dreams. Sweet dreams. Of this. <laughs> In the following months, Eric distracted himself by writing an epic science fiction novel. Lyle was busy courting a former Playboy playmate named Anna Erickson. Did you hear I killed my family? They started out as pen pals, and romance soon blossomed after a prison visit. I heard about this. Man. Like, they got crazy pussy. <laughs> like, thousands, <laughs> thousands of letters. Yeah. Fan letters. People that supported Pictures. Them. Like, nude pictures of, like fans yeah every killer does it's insane yep it makes you want to like get into this yeah let's kill oh, somebody yeah. <laughs> i killed my mom for the yeah. pussy yeah. <laughs> the pussy uh, the pussy <laughs> this podcast is going to be used as evidence yeah. someday exhibit yeah. a yeah on the night of june 17th 1994 a new neighbor moved into the holding cell next to eric's uh-oh oj simpson i was gonna say early 90s prisoner yeah. dun, dun, dun. eric had watched the infamous bronco chase on tv earlier that day while he was on cleaning duty earlier that day he told the fallen football star that they had previously met when his dad jose was an executive at hertz yep oj was oh, famously it all comes back a spokesman for hertz yeah in the 70s well i, I think his backside hurts after oh, uh, you know, with his dad. oh <laughs> cue that up <laughs> okay oh, don't it yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're going to get canceled before we're arrested. These are some yep. juniors we're throwing out here. <laughs> OJ was depressed at the prospect of losing his good standing in the media. I guess I won't be working for NBC anymore, he lamented. Little did Eric know that OJ's trial would end up being the final nail in his own coffin. Dun, bum, bum. His eventual acquittal would embarrass Los Angeles courts. It came in the wake of the Rodney King and McMartin verdicts, yep. which were considered legal failures. D.A. Gil Garcetti was determined not to let that happen again. Eric's dad, the, the last mayor. Yeah. By the start of the second trial in August 1995, the Menendez family was broke. Everything was gone. The brothers' legal fees would now be paid for by the state of California. Oh, my God. Jesus. Leslie Abramson's request to be appointed as Eric's public defender was granted. So she was able to stay on the case, but with a steep pay cut. Wow. Of course, this case made her. They shouldn't have even paid her any money. But they didn't know that it was going to become this huge, you know, uh, thing this this show yeah it's the, years you know. and years though but they wouldn't have point. been able to have her because you have to be appointed someone if you're considered like indigent mm -hmm. so, yeah like yeah no but they didn't have to burn all their money on these lawyers because right. now like if it's a high profile case you know uh some of these uh big time lawyers will take it for free just for the notoriety oh yeah mm -hmm. yeah they're cutting into the fucking two pay budget here <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> daddy needs his hair <laughs> For the second trial, there were a few dramatic differences in the courtroom. Judge Weisberg got rid of the cameras. He limited testimonies on sexual abuse, citing that they were irrelevant. And there was only one jury. In the other trial, there was a jury for each brother. Two brothers. <laughs> Two lawyers. During the first trial, law professor Alan Dershowitz popularized the term the abuse excuse, which he thought enabled people to get away with murder. Yeah, I could see why a guy, a scumbag like this, wouldn't like people utilizing, uh, you know, sexual abuse as a problem because yeah. he was on Epstein's Island getting massages by 17-year-old yep. girls. He's like, Jose was an upstanding man. Yeah, exactly. With less media exposure and no case for defense, the brothers' fate was all but sealed. And we have a little clip here. Jurors also didn't hear from over 40 teachers, coaches, and family friends who appeared at Menendez One. The judge just whittles away at our defense, makes it smaller and smaller and smaller, and then when it gets so tiny, he says, well, that's not worth very much, and tosses it away. It's, it's unbelievable. For the defense, it was a crippling decision. But the harshest blow came on the final day of the trial when Judge Stanley Weisberg ruled that jurors could not consider a manslaughter conviction for Kitty Menendez as they had in the first trial. 
Why? Leslie Abramson angrily declared in court that she had been incompetent in representing her client and wanted that on the record. Around. Outside the courthouse, she angrily spoke with reporters. You know, enough already. Surprised he doesn't just take out a rifle in the courtroom and shoot him. And you blame it on... Oh wow. my God! Yeah. Like I said, she was a show woman. Yeah, she was a real spark plug. They took that away for Kitty's murder because they couldn't find a reason why they had to kill the mom because Jose was doing all the abuse. She at that was time. the fucking secondhand man, right? But that's what they were claiming that it was basically just cruel to kill her the way they did when Jose was really the big threat. Listen, Ava Braun was in trouble too. If they weren't fucking killing themselves in the bunker. Well, so, hey, I didn't make the rules. How can you argue with that? Yeah, you can't. On March 20th, <laughs> 1996, after 16 hours of deliberation, the jury found Eric and Lyle guilty of murder in the first degree. Dun, dun, dun. They were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Without is cruel. And after the sentence, they did an interview with Barbara Walters. She loves doing these very fuzzy uh, picture uh, interviews in which, you know, it d- she doesn't want to see the contours of her skin. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing she was on her way out when HD came in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true, though. Why did you kill your They parents? made fun of this on SNL all the time. It was like... <laughs> there are people, a great number of people, who think that you two are spoiled brats, that you are evil, that you are monsters. What do you say to them? I would be surprised if anybody that was present at the trial and uh, and saw the whole thing, rather than snippets on the news, uh, would feel that. A jury found you both guilty. Right, but I don't think what does that you aren't guilty because they found you spoiled. Mm-hmm. Um, or evil. Or evil. Just a normal, I'm mean, just a normal kid. Oh, Eric, you're a normal kid who killed your parents. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You still <laughs> oh say my you're God. You're not normal. She's being harsh. Well, I, I didn't have normal experiences, but I, I am. I, I, I did that, and uh, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about what happened and wish that I could, I could take that moment back or change what happened. Mm. Yeah, I mean, they were remorseful, and everything they said after being sentenced to life in prison revolved around that, you know, they regret that it happened, and nobody should ever follow in their footsteps. They didn't want to glamorize it, and they will take their punishment. Did they do any uh, appeals or retrials? Yeah, they did. They exhausted all their appeals. Oh, my God. In September 1996, both brothers were awoken in the middle of the night and brought outside to separate vans. Much to their dismay, they realized they were being transferred to separate prisons, Oof. which means they would most likely never see each other again. Man. Wow. In 2005, the brothers were denied their final appeal, even though Judge Alex Kaczynski suggested there may have been, quote, collusion between the L.A. County District Attorney's Office and Judge Stanley Weisberg in order to secure a conviction. Because they were so embarrassed by everything. says that. Uh-huh. That is crazy. still denied the appeal. Wow. Jud- judges never rat them on their own. They're like cops like that. It's like the blue wall. Yeah. That's crazy. I wonder if he did that as a way to be like, well, this final appeal technically is a denial, but I'm leaving the room open for someone, uh, some hotshot lawyer to come in and be like, hey, what the fuck did you just say? And take it to the Supreme Court. Oh, yeah. yeah. Who knows? Yeah, it just seems like a lot of paperwork. But it's hard to get that done when you don't really have any money. Yeah. yeah. The brothers were finally reunited in 2018 at the R.J. Donovan Correctional Facility in San Diego. Mm. According to journalist Robert Rand, Eric and Lyle got one look at each other and burst into tears. Quote, they just hugged each other for a few minutes without saying any words. Then the prison officials let them spend an hour together in a room, end quote. Eric and Lyle are considered productive members of the prison community. In fact, they just got done working on a big mural project there. What, have uh, their parents liquefied? (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) God. This was a very moving moment here. (laughs) Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. They're reunited. For sure, for sure, for sure, for sure. (laughs) If there's some kind of happy ending, 
It's that they're now together, and both of them were able to get married behind bars. To each other? <laughs> Lyle twice, actually, because he married Anna Erickson, and then she found out he was cheating on her <laughs> with other women through letters. This guy's a dog. Does he have uh, conjugal visits? Yes. I wish he didn't blow it on the uh, who filed for divorce thing because it's hilarious just thinking about a guy in prison being like, marriage, I can't do it. (laughs) Prison? Fine. (laughs) Yeah. It's like that movie, Irreconcilable Differences. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I'm I'm feeling very trapped by this relationship. (laughs) It's like I'm behind bars here. (laughs) But there may be an even happier ending on the horizon for the brothers. Robert Rand, remember the reporter who's all over this case, wrote that book? Mm -hmm. He was a consultant for the 2017 series Law and Order, The Menendez Brothers, in which Edie Falco played Leslie Abramson. Robert Rand spoke extensively with the brother's aunt, Marta Cano, who helped him with fact-checking. She hinted at the possible existence of letters between her son, Andy, and Eric, but they hadn't surfaced yet. Tragically, Andy Cano died from an overdose of sleeping pills in 2003. Marta thinks he never got over the outcome of the trial. In 2018, Robert Rand visited Marta in Florida. Within an hour, they found a handwritten letter from Eric to Andy, dated December 1988. And Kyle, can you help us with that? Yes. So this letter was written from Eric to Andy. Yeah. He said, I've been trying to avoid dad. It's still happening, Andy, but it's worse for me now. Every night I stay up thinking he might come in. I need to put it out of my mind. I know what you said before, but I'm afraid. You just don't know dad like I do. He's crazy. He's warned me a hundred times about telling anyone, especially Lyle. Am I a serious wimpus? So what's important about this letter is that it could qualify as new evidence. Yes. Another explosive development, Menendez plus Menudo. Mm-hmm. See, I was wondering if there was some connection there because the dad was into you know younger kids and stuff, so maybe there was a connection mm-hmm. that he was like a man in power dealing with them. Oh, there's a connection. Menendez plus Menudo is the Peacock docu-series that has just been released, or as I call it, Menundo. <laughs> okay, I Menendo. can see that was naturally going to get there. <laughs> I'm just riffing. Menudez. <laughs> former member... We'll work on it. <laughs> former member Roy Rosselló, or Rossello as American people pronounce it, spoke out about founder Edgardo Diaz sexually abusing him on a near constant basis. So the founder of Menudo was a monster, Mm. like Jose. Jeez. And Roy says that when he was in the group from 1983 to 1986, it was just the worst kind of rape and assault that went on for the entire time he was in the band. Mm. I thought it was just like Lou Pearlman, but with the mustache. (laughs) No. (laughs) And everyone in Menudo, they were kids. In fact... Edgardo's plan was to make it so that they were always young. So when the members would turn 16, he would shuffle in new members of Menudo. It wasn't even just for the fact that, you know, for the kids, it was for him also, for his own pleasure. That's so gross. And someone who was around at the time said that Edgardo basically had the same taste in boys that a 13-year-old girl would have. Good God. And that's how he cast the group. Oh, my God. And this Roy guy... Roy Rosselló, he got the worst of it. Mm. He was considered Edgardo's number one boy. Man. Jesus. But there's another abuser that Roy talks about. Can you do this clip? Jose Menendez. Oh, fuck. It's time for the world to know the truth. My brother is sexually abused for most of his life by his own father. He deserves to be free. It's heartbreaking to hear that there was another victim of my father. This is not about revenge. This is about justice. Yo tenía 13 años. 13 years Edgardo, old. Edgardo, él dijo, ahora llegó el momento. Él me dijo, hoy vamos a cenar en la casa de Menéndez. He's being forced to go to the Jose's house for dinner. of RCA. Cuando yo entro en la limusina, 
Yo veo Menéndez mirándome con los ojos queriendo comerme. Yo sentí el clima cuando yo entré en esa casa. Sentí el clima de abusos tan pesado, tan cargado, tan negativo en esa casa que yo me sentí mal. Yeah, if people are just listening without seeing that video. He said, uh, you know, he was looked at by Jose with uh, very dark eyes and there was a negative energy in the house. Like he wanted to eat him. Yes, devour him. It's Man. very sick. So they just signed with RCA, that big $30 million deal. And there's a picture. Do you have the picture? I was showing that before, you. Yeah. Okay, so what happened that night? He went there for dinner. He met Eric and Lyle, and Eric in the documentary confirms that he remembers meeting Roy wow. that night. And Roy alleges that Jose drugged him and then had his way with him. Jesus. There's a picture of them with Jose, the whole group, Menudo. That's and crazy. Roy says you can tell how uncomfortable he was because he's off to the side wanting nothing Not looking to do at them. Yeah. with the rest of the group or Jose. Wow. Who's smiling. Oof. So that's a thing. Horrible. Mark Garagos. Uh, yeah, I know. We know him. Big uh, celebrity lawyer represented Michael Jackson. And, yeah. and OJ Simpson. This is the second uh, OJ Simpson team. Lawyer was and he? Winona Ryder too. Yeah, I didn't know he was part of OJ's team. I'm pretty sure. Ah, was he? Maybe he was like the uh, the B squad or I something. I mean, who wasn't a part of OJ's yeah. team at one point? Yeah, Garagos is best known for representing OJ Simpson. Really? 1994. Yeah, he had the fucking glam squad over there. You're he right. Everybody. I know. Yeah. I was just thinking of Shapiro and Cochran. Every fucking shady scumbag lawyer that still exists today is pretty much... Maybe Garagos was like the sixth man. You yeah. Know? Right. He, he, was on, he was on the bench, <laughs> but they man award. Yeah. No, I think the sixth man was Robert Kardashian. Yeah. yeah. Well, he was... Yeah, he was the starting point guard. Yeah. He, he, was, fucking... he was the ace in the hole. <laughs> so a petition was filed... Recently, on May 3rd, 2023, requesting that the court look at the case again and vacate the convictions. Attorneys argue that the new evidence, that found letter, and Roy from Menudo, that that constitutes a review of the case. Hmm. Yeah. And while this is all going on, in the past few years, the Menendez brothers have actually become popular with a younger generation of people. They are superstars on TikTok. <laughs> I don't believe they got a fair trial. They don't deserve to live the rest of their life in prison. I think they're seen as the victims of a less enlightened They got adoring fans Who out there. Who could imagine 30 years after a double murder that Gen Z on TikTok would take on the Menendez case? Calling all true crime fans. So when the videos first started coming out, the content being created around the Menendez brothers was about how hot they were. The first videos that my son showed ah, me on TikTok were a lot of young women who were lip syncing to the Britney Spears song, Mama, I'm in love with a criminal. People are like, oh, who is this like hot guy on the court stand? You know, ah. like, and then I think people started doing the research into the Menendez case and being like, oh, this is like sick and twisted. I think that's what like, you this did, lady. Is so yeah. Wrong. It's You're a just lot talking of kids about yourself. Going back, watching court TV, seeing how everything was portrayed, but looking at it with a fresh set of eyes and a different set of values. Oh, there's that, that girl, Taylor Lorenz. She's that, that kooky girl that works for the Washington Post. Uh, Who's this guy? Uh, Barry Sheck. Yeah, he was, he was the seventh man. Maybe. Yeah, so <laughs> it's crazy. Either this whole thing with the OJ Simpson fucking team, uh, they either died of horrific diseases because they let it freaking definitely. A uh, guilty man walk free, or all the survivors, including Mark Garagos, Barry Sheck was actually the founder of the Innocence Project. Yeah. Uh, so he was like, fuck, off. man, I got to yeah. get this bad juju off me. We're founding the Innocence Project. They've gotten a million people, well, they've gotten a decent amount of people out of death row and prison uh, for life sentences based on new evidence coming to light. And Mark Garagos is one of those people now that's trying to help the Menendez mm, brothers yeah. instead of trying to be the prosecution side where he's trying to put people well, in Well, we see, we see what happened with uh, uh, Johnny Cochran, no longer with us. Yeah, exactly. Mm. F. Lee, F. Lee Bailey, Kardashian. with the fishes. Kardashian, yeah. dead. He didn't even live to see his, his daughter family. fuck everybody. Oh, whoa, <laughs> whoa, whoa. <laughs> on that note, yeah. Robert Rand closes his book 
about the Menendez brothers with the following statement. The time has come to seriously consider releasing Eric and Lyle Menendez from prison. Hey. That's all I got, folks. I agree. I agree. It's time to take a, another peek at it, man. What are they, in their 50s? Mm-hmm. Uh, that, yeah. Maybe older than that now. Huh? Yeah. They they're could like be 100. Getting, yeah, they're 100. They could be getting close to like 60 now. Uh, yeah. Lyle is 55. Okay. And you Eric, know they still got some time to you know come back out. That that I mean they will be, they will be like stars when they come out. Fifty five yeah. and fifty two, yeah. It would be a, a ticking time bomb as to a, a very short countdown into how uh, how long it would take to get them like a TV show or something. I could just see some like the show. UTA meeting right now. <laughs> so let's get you guys in some fucking meetings, okay? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I'll yeah. get a reality show. Yeah, House, cool. House of Menendez. Yeah, this oh. ball on CBS. <laughs> you know, Red Bloods or something. Or, you know. or they finally produce Friends. Yeah, they get that <laughs> off the ground. Yeah, Lord, whatever the guy. We're guys. just friends. <laughs> yeah. Take my picture. Half yeah. naked. <laughs> <Yeah>. Friend. <laughs> <laughs> That's a uh, friend. A table for two, monsieur. <laughs> a table for two friends. Yeah. Menendez. I think it's very unfortunate. I don't know if it was done on purpose or not. Um, I, well, it was an unfortunate thing that their cousin Andy died because he had the letter that actually put in writing in the time that it was happening that they were being abused. He testified during the trial. Andy did. Yeah. yeah. So, so like wow. it's already on public no. record. Right, but I think he just forgot about that letter. But that's hard evidence. Like, mm-hmm. you could lie on the stand, but evidence don't lie. And same with Roy Voseo. He said that he would have loved to have helped the Menendez brothers at the time. It just didn't occur to him. Because wow. he didn't admit the abuse went on until much, much later. And yeah. that lawyer, you know, she was a spitfire, and she's giving people the finger. She's a real pit bull. But uh, yeah. she, like, dropped the ball in a couple things. She's like, the judge should have pulled out a rifle and shot them. I, that was like, crazy. Well, that's a little, yeah. uh, you know, on the nose. A little <laughs> over the top there, <laughs> yeah. honey. Let's dial it back a little bit. So final thoughts. Um, final thoughts. I think the things that came out as you were telling the story and reading certain things... I have had uh, experiences in my life with sexual abusers, not for me, but for people I'm very close to. And a lot of the things that were happening are very similar to what I know to be true Mm. that I experienced with these people, like being locked out of the room and being told to go away or don't come near this room at a certain time. Um, That to me was gave me goosebumps, honestly. Um, And I think, fuck, if this stuff is really true, Kitty and Jose deserve to go and fucking let them out. It's like the rose petal murders to me. If you're harming kids, fucking see you later, man. This Bye-bye. case yeah. makes the rose petal murders look like the rose parade. Yeah, for real. <laughs> <laughs> Pasadena. Because there was just so much collusion between the two parties to make sure that their kids never told each other oh. or anyone else. And the courts. Yeah. Because they were embarrassed by OJ. And so they said, we need a conviction here because yeah. we look like fools that we're oh. not convicting these murderers. That's Everything is working against him. I, yeah, it's generational abuse. I, I'm mm-hmm. sure he passed it down from his grand father or uncle or something and not to you know give him a pass or anything i just got the chills again so getting a mistrial almost fucked them because they allowed oj's trial to be finished and then they were like we need to get these guys yeah yep. yeah god if they if they only allegedly got embarrassed but they got embarrassed by oj because oj was guilty in my opinion yeah <laughs> that and, future episode uh, yeah and a lot <laughs> of other take. people yeah, yeah. yeah. Mark's had a lot of hot takes I know, on this I, episode i'm sticking with my character that i've set up at the beginning of this episode <laughs> it's called acting alejandro yeah no but it's true though and <laughs> and then the, he they got screwed because they were not definitely not innocent but yeah. they were in some gray area where you know it was just like like the 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 you know the jury or in the someone should have saw the nuances of that and not really just given them through the fucking book at them. Even which it's, is what yeah, happened? Voluntary manslaughter. Even if they got to do fifteen years, they still have their whole lives ahead of them. Fifteen years. Yeah, that sounds well, that sounds more. Yeah. And interestingly enough, 
I heard an old clip from the 2000s of Mark Garagos on Adam Carolla's radio show before he was involved in the case at all. Yeah. And they're talking about the Menendez brothers, and he felt like they should be freed. Yeah. yeah. And Adam Carolla actually had a good take hey, on hey, it. Hey, hey. He's like, yeah, you know, they do the 15 years, whatever. Like, that's enough. Yeah. Let him out because even Adam Carolla yeah. says that. He he's said, like a right wing uh, Mr. Law and Order himself. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> dun, dun. Yeah, because he's like, if there's one brother that murders the parents, that's one thing. Yeah. But for one of the brothers to say to the other brother, hey, why don't we shoot our parents? And then the other brother goes, what day? Yeah. That means the parents did a shitty job raising them. That <sighs> means there's a reason that they fucking shot them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, truth. <laughs> it's crazy to uh, to think that you know that this dude Man from Menudo would be making this up way down the line to get some attention thirty years after the fact. Like, That's another yeah. thing. This yeah. guy was clearly abused by the same person. I guarantee there's more. If they're they might be alive, they might not be, but they might have like the old school mentality of like this is very fucking embarrassing. And some people just want to let sleeping dogs lie. Yeah, mm -hmm. they could be in denial about it, being like it never happened. And yeah. there are I other members. Yeah, and there are other members of Menudo that say Edgardo, Ricky Martin, Edgardo Diaz was abusive to them as well. Wow. Ricky Martin has kept his mouth shut. Yeah, he's got his own. There are some... He's got his own cousins. <laughs> oh my, oh god. my god! That was, for the record, you know, that was um, that was denied after the fact. Proven to be false. We got Mark's or Ricky no, Martin's no. lawyer here. The cousin recanted. Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm uh, Marcos Garagos. Here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there's a lot to unpack here. Yeah. We'll have to revisit it on another occasion because there will be new developments. Yeah. In the near future, hopefully. And there's a Ryan Murphy series coming out next year. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Just like he did the Dahmer series. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the Menendez brothers. That should be fun. Get Dana Gould. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he might have aged out of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> de age him. <laughs> no, he can play the. Put a milkman hat yeah. on him. No offense to him. I love Dana Gould, but. Just like the Irishman. He's got a milkman hat on him. <laughs> yeah. De age him. He's 18. <laughs> he's, he's unloading a milk truck <laughs> yeah. when he's 20. He's with kicking his. Dad's body, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nowhere he, near it. He could play the older version, though, <laughs> yeah. now. When yeah, yes, probably. Exactly. probably yeah. Prison. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, thank you all for listening. The yes. only RIP I have is to Cousin Andy. Fuck jo Jose and fuck uh, Kitty. Yeah. I, I'm not a, a fan. Um, we had some nice comments on Instagram. I, I think Sam gave us a nice one. She said uh, she how much she loved the, the Ray... Um, what's his name? Combs. Ray, Ray Combs, Combs episode, one. and um, she lives in Ohio and was uh, giving us credit for shitting on Ohio. <laughs> yeah, so. everyone from Ohio <laughs> loves shitting on Ohio for some reason. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, please, you know, as always, please give us a nice comment, a five star on iTunes uh, or Spotify. That goes a long way in getting our um, getting us upvoted there, and yes. it's very helpful. YouTube, you know, always our, our subscriber numbers are going up, you know, daily, yep. and we love that. Over and seven thousand on TikTok now. Seven thousand on TikTok. We are influencers. That hype house is getting built. Yep. You know, no matter what, we're gonna have a <laughs> hype house somewhere. That's so. right. And we can get a hype house sooner if you join our Patreon. Oh, good yes. segue. It's Where? The Patreon. By the way, you will be able to find an extra episode of us going through some more Menendez clips. Yes. yes. Pop culture Menendez references. Yeah. And the John Mark Carr minisode. So. Yeah. We have some really scandal. If, if you think this was wild, the Patreon is wild. Yes. It's, it's out of pocket. It's being as set I ablaze. Say. Yes. You won't it's, want to miss it. With yeah. our conversation with admitted pedophile and fake John Benet Ramsey killer. John Mark Carr. Yeah. <laughs> if you think Kyle is unhinged on this regular episode, it gets Ooh, really unhinged wee. on the Patreon, so get over there. Yep. And until next time, don't go dying on us. You have just heard... A true Hollywood murder mystery. I have never seen anything like this before. The movies, Broadway, music, television, all of it. A place that manufactures nightmares. Okay, everybody, that's a wrap. Good night. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon.